almost said good morning, but good evening. Welcome to worship this evening at Wrightsville United Methodist Church and Sundays at 6. We are so glad that you are here with us. I am, if we haven't had a chance to meet, I am Christina Turner and I am one of the pastors here at Wrightsville. And I am here in downtown Wilmington with my kitty cat Finn and we are so glad that you are here worshiping with us this evening. We have been trying out some new ways of technology and connecting. And so this week we were doing a little bit of something, having an introductory set with our musicians who can't be um, together in person, but, um, but just to bring their music from afar. So if you weren't able to hear part one of this on the premiere video, maybe go over after this is finished and check it out. We've got some music on the fiddle, Be Thou My Vision with Annie Jewell, and also an Annie Oak recording of, of I'll Fly Away and Amazing Grace by David and Claire Canning. So we are so grateful for our musicians coming to us today. We also had a prayer that was shared by uh, Nadia Boltzweber. Um, and I just love to welcome you here into my living room and um, and just into this space, this sacred space that we are making together. So feel free as we are are we are gathering here to say hi in the comments and to to let your fellow worshipers know that you are here and um, and maybe also where you're worshiping from this evening. I am so grateful to be able to be here with you and grateful for the gift of technology. We at Sundays at Six are a space that exists to bring um, to bring comfort, to bring peace, to bring a little bit of ourselves, however we are, however messy or or bedheaded or whatever. And so we are so grateful that you are here. And just a couple announcements to uh, to kind of get our the rest of our worship time started. We are having an online talent show, and so we would love for you to participate. It is going to be called Hey Rights Phil, Look at Me. And so we have lots of folks, uh, some of you who have been practicing for recitals or looking um or having sports games canceled. And so we would love for you to, to show off to your church family. We want to be your biggest cheerleaders. And so we would love for you to post in the Hey Wrightsville Look at Me event page and to see that there. We also um, are having a super service Saturday slideshow that will be airing this week. But remember, our Vision 2020 practice for the month of April is outreach. And so we would love for you to find a way to serve. Um, there's some awesome ways to serve up on our Serve Locally page on rightsvilleumc.org. And you can check that out there. If you're in need of a project for you or your family to um, just to reach out in. We'll be having a slideshow of some of those things next week, and we are grateful for all of our folks who are leading us. We also encourage you, if you are able, to please give. If you can can still do that right now, there's a couple different ways you can give. You can give on rightsvilleumc.org, uh, click on the financial giving spot, or you can also give on our app, or you can do the old-fashioned way. You can write out a check to Wrightsville United Methodist Church, P.O. Box 748, Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina, 28480. I wrote it down this week, so I would remember it. But um, we would love to, um, to have you continue to give and to be generous. Our outreach committee is featuring a different organization every week, and this week it is Hope Recuperative Care. Hope Recuperative Care is an organization that works with folks to provide uh, respite and to provide a, play, a safe place to heal and recover whenever they are getting out of the hospital. They are especially in need right now during COVID-19. And so all of, um, all of the donations that come in for that can be marked outreach slash hope recuperative care. 
and this serves different folks who are unsheltered in our community who are experiencing homelessness and we'll be featuring more about them this week as well and now friends i just invite you we have already been worshiping in song but now i just invite you to maybe take a deep breath in to let a deep breath out to let the light of Christ shine upon you, to let the love of Christ overwhelm you. And would you pray with me? Oh God, you are our help in ages past and our hope in years to come. You have promised that wherever two or three are gathered in your name, you are there with us. So be with us, Lord. Be with us across the miles and across, um, across the street. When we can't hold each other close, hold us close. Speak to us now, Lord, for your servants are listening. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Welcome. As you are coming in, I invite you just to say hi and to say where you're, maybe where you're watching from, where you're worshiping from. You can see my house. I'm enjoying the sunshine this evening. And I also am um, enjoying just the chance to, to reach out while staying in. Um, if you miss the first couple minutes with music by Annie and David and Claire and Annie Oak, then go back and check that out after this. But I'm so glad to have you here with us. Our scripture today comes from the book of Acts, and we are um, in which we are considering where God is calling us to move forward in faith and in hope and in love. And but fortunately, we don't have to do it alone. Um, in the book of Acts, it tells a story about the first Christians, the very first Christians before they were even called Christians, and how they how they kind of uh, made it up as they went along through the power of the Holy Spirit. I think musicians call it improvisation when you take what is great from the past and you build on it and, um, and make something beautiful and something new. And so we're going to be thinking in the next couple weeks about, um, about how to live creatively in the face of challenges. And so I'm so glad that you're here with me and Finn, whether you're from your back patio, your back porch, or your comfy couch. But I invite you to hear this scripture that comes from the book of Acts, chapter 2. We're going to start with verse 14a and then skip down to 22. But Peter, standing with the eleven disciples, raised his voice and addressed them. You that are Israelites, listen to what I have to say. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with deeds of power, wonders, and signs that God did through him among you, as you yourselves know. This man handed over to you according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of those outside the law. But God raised him up, having freed him from death, because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand so that I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh will live in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One experience corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Fellow Israelites, I may say to you confidently, David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would put one of his descendants on the throne. Foreseeing this, David spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, saying, He was not abandoned to hell, nor did his flesh experience corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that all of us are witnesses. Being therefore exalted on the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you both see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. 
This was the very first Pentecost sermon that Peter preached. And, um, and after it was a response that I think that, on, that every preacher could only hope to have. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers and sisters, what should we do? Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed Peter's message were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 persons were added. Amen. This is a scripture that we normally think of with Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost, that day in which the fire of the Holy Spirit came down and, um, and the apostles spoke with languages, with other languages, even though they didn't know them. They were simple, regular people, fishermen and prostitutes, tax collectors and dealers of purple cloth. They were ordinary people, those ordinary people that Jesus chose to be the ones who would spread his message throughout the world. I think sometimes uh, that I look at people in the past and think, oh, they must have a beautiful halo of light shining on them. Um, possibly a little bit like the halo of light that is shining in from my window right now. It's one of those strange things that we are normal people, but we kind of in the imaginations of the people that come after us will likely be those heroic folks that stayed at home for how many weeks? How many weeks did they not have church? What did they wear on their faces? Bananas? No bandanas. They sewed masks from their house. They figured all of this stuff out as they went along. It's easy to make people in the past be heroes and saints, even when they were regular old saints and sinners. Peter's message is one of these things that I don't really read that much. We read the dramatic part of Acts 2, right? The part with the whooshing and the wind and all of the different languages. Wind and fire, languages, that kind of, you know, Holy Spirit, divine pyrotechnics. That's the sort of thing that we're used to, uh, you know, if, even if we don't understand it, we like it. <laughs> it's dramatic. It's the sort of thing that would be on a Netflix or Hulu special. But we don't usually read the sermon that Peter gives afterwards. Maybe it's because, um, I don't know, people like fire more than they like sermons. I'm sorry it's a vocational hazard, but it's true. But the sermon, as I was looking at it this week and a couple weeks ago, I noticed about how unusual it is that Peter, Jesus's friend, um, is taking the things that God has told them in the past and is making them new, is bringing them into the very things that he is seeing and hearing with his eyes and ears. Do you see how he goes kind of back and forth and back and forth? Um, it's like a, a musician, a great musician, not a musician like me that can plunk out Mary Had a Little Lamb on the piano um, if, you know, if the sun is shining right and uh, my fingers are working correctly. Musicians like Annie and David and Justin and Claire and Isabel who are trained and who have practiced their scales and know those things from, um, they know things by heart so that in the future they can make up something beautiful and new. Did you hear it? Um, do you see it? The, um, the scriptures right there that Peter quotes He's going back and forth between the past and the present. <laughs> I wonder if Peter had a cat that was uh, meowing aggressively beside him. Um, Peter says, he quotes, the, he quotes David. I saw the Lord always before me. 
he talks about the past as a way of understanding the present. And the crazy thing is that he doesn't just keep it in the past. He says that Jesus, that all of those folks, um, and all of those things from the past are coming true right now. He keeps slipping back and forth between the past and the present and the past and the present. Um, and sometimes it's hard to say, what are, are you looking at what scripture said before? Or are you looking at what's happening now? It's that sort of thing that when you are one of Jesus's followers, you never quite know. Is it something old or is it something new? I was thinking this week about all of the folks who are doing something new based on old skills. I um, am thinking of all of those old words that are being made new, right? All of those old words like community and communion. All of those old words like repentance. <laughs> The writer Brene Brown uh, talks about um, about this. She, this week, uh, this month, this, I don't know, maybe last month, you'll have to forgive me, y'all. It's all about connection and not perfection. But Brene Brown says that we are not called to go back to, um, to go back to normal. Brene Brown says that we're being called to make a new normal to create new systems, new ways of being, new ways of living our lives that don't, um, that don't just recreate where we were before. I, um, I imagine that it was hard for the early Christians, for Peter and James and John and Mary Magdalene and Phoebe and Lydia and all of those folks to say, what are you supposed to do again? We're baptizing them? What? What's happening, Jesus? What are you calling us to do? We need a training class. We need a roadmap. And yet, and yet, without a roadmap, without a training class, without six to eight weeks of preparation, they took one step after another, after another, after another, and stepped right there into God's future. Friends, I am not um, a big fan of the word repent. It's kind of strange that in this Easter season that, um, that this word might come up over and over and over um, in this text. And if it doesn't come up over and over and over, it, Peter, Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. He uses kind of harsh words, right? He says, repent and be baptized. It says that they were cut to the heart. He tells them that you gave him over to death. You crucified and killed Jesus. It's not exactly the sort of thing that you, uh, that you say if you want to get folks to come, uh, come to your church, to be honest, or come to your Facebook Live. It's not the kind of sermon that draws a big crowd, right? And yet, this, um, in the words of some theologians smarter than me, sometimes before you hear good news, you have to understand the bad news. The word repent just means to turn around. It literally means to turn around, to take what doesn't fit anymore, to take uh, what the Bible calls old wineskins and not pour new wine into them. Repent is like if you are marching in the military or, or a marching band, you are going in one direction and repent says, stop, turn around, about face. It is time to go this way instead. Repent, uh, some folks use the word metanoia and it means a new mind, uh, to have a new way of thinking and a new way of looking at things. Brene Brown, in her new podcast, Unlocking Us, uh, talks about, um, about this new normal that we are being called to, or what I would call a back to abnormal, because I think that what God is calling us to in calling us to repent is saying, don't just recreate life the way it was. Make it better than it was.
I'm going to flip you over so you can see this quote from Brene. She says, we will not go back to normal. Normal never was. Our pre-corona existence was not normal, other than that we had normalized greed and inequity and exhaustion, depletion, extraction, disconnection, confusion, rage, hoarding, hate, and lack. We should not long to return, my friends. We are being given the opportunity to stitch a new garment. I love that. To stitch a new garment, one that fits all of humanity and all of nature. How are you stitching a new garment? How is God maybe inviting you to turn around? It doesn't mean that God made the coronavirus so that we would turn around. That is not what I'm saying. And yet, God is giving us, I think, an opportunity to create a normal that is better than the normal before. All of those things that we see, people who are unsheltered, kids who are out of school and don't have access to the internet, um, people who are lonely or in nursing homes and don't have any family members to look after them, employment that is insecure, folks that are living just on the edge. All of this stuff existed before. But maybe, maybe Jesus is offering us the opportunity to have it not exist after this. So what does it mean for us to repent? I am just going to uh, sit back for a little bit and to, to ha let us have an opportunity to discuss in the comments. What maybe needs to change in you, in me, in our community? How does Jesus want us to repent so that just like those first Christians who were baptized and, and came anew to faith, who were in a whole new world, how does God want to create a new world in us and through us and with us? As Brene Brown said, um, our, other, our existence was not normal, except that we normalized greed and inequity. But what would it look like if instead of greed and inequity, the normal was generosity and equality? What would it look like instead of exhaustion and depletion for the, the new normal to be rest and rejuvenation? What instead of disconnection and confusion, what would it mean like for this new world that we, that God is creating to mean connection, community, clarity, love, generosity, abundance, and enough? What would that mean if we didn't just put on the old garment that maybe doesn't fit us anymore, but that we created right there with God, stitching by hand, a new piece of tailored clothing that is God's best for us, God's best for our community, and God's best for our world. I don't know. And so I'm wondering if we can reflect together, if in the comments over the next couple minutes, um, as we listen to that song again that Annie played so beautifully for us, Be Thou My Vision, if you would share in the comments, how is God inviting you to change? How is God inviting our community to change? I invite us to, to reflect together and to share any prayer requests or any way we can support each other together. And then we will come back to hear our closing song by Annie and Isabel and also um, to hear the story of a Christian from the past a Christian um, named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. So let's reflect together.
would love to hear any reflections that you have. How is God inviting you to change? What would that new normal look like? Feel free to type that in the comments. And we are also going to, um, while we do that, we will hear that song that Annie played beautifully as we have a conversation together. says that she is slowing down and being grateful for what she has. I am feeling that too. And learning to be more comfortable with chaos and uncertainty and making it up as I go along. And also to be more comfortable with silence and imperfection. Annie says that she feels that God wants her to take time to notice the natural beauty all around. Ashley to slow down and enjoy time with family and friends. I wonder if that's an invitation to us, that word, that, that phrase that keeps popping up, slowing down, taking time. says that she's reminded in this time of uncertainty that even though she tries to imagine solutions, God has them even when she cannot imagine what they will be. What a, what a beautiful reflection. I wonder also how our community might need to change thinking about me and all of the ways that I normally just go to Target <laughs> and buy things at any hour of the day and without any thought of where they come from. And the other day being at buying some herb plants from Port City Produce, I thought, oh, these are local strawberries. I thought, how can I support a small business right now? How can I keep this money in our community? And I am wondering how I can keep that up after this time. what Annie has shared about the birds singing, the smell of the wildflowers in her yard, the wonderful family she gets to quarantine with, and Ashley, the time with family and friends through long phone calls. I keep hearing a couple of these phrases bubble up about the beauty of nature, about slowing down, and about being comfortable with uncertainty wherever we are.
Thank you to Annie for um, for the beautiful violin music. We're so glad that she is able to be back to um, fiddling for us. Just love to close out our time together with a reflection on um, the life of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I don't know if y'all know Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He is um, one of those saints that seems larger than life. If you've heard about Bonhoeffer, he uh, was a pastor in the 1930s and the 1940s in Germany and with all of that, all that that entails. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer um, in this book uh, describes how even despite um, even despite persecution of of Christians by by Nazis, um, even as the church was kind of taken over by um, by this evil ideology that folks needed to repent of, how he created an underground seminary for the Christians that said, "No, this is not the way of Jesus." I've been thinking a lot about uh, World War II and about folks from the past, and um, and and these these victory gardens that um, that people grew, and um, all of the women that went into factories and became Rosie the Riveters, <laughs> and how I wonder how folks will look back on us. But Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in this book, he talks about um, about confession as a discipline that we um, haven't really practiced very much. He says that um, in confession, we affirm and accept our cross and we receive Jesus as our rescue and our salvation. He talks about um, confessing sometimes our sin to each other and that when we can do that with each other, that we say, here is someone who is a sinner just like me, who wants to confess and yearns for God's forgiveness. And he says that we are called to confess, to repent, to turn away. Dietrich Bonhoeffer had um, a tablet that was unveiled in the church um, in Flossenburg, which was a concentration camp. Um, in Germany on Easter Monday 1953 it said just this this simple inscription Dietrich Bonhoeffer a witness of Jesus Christ among his brethren born February 4th 1906 in Breslov died April 9th 1945 in Flossenburg if you didn't know about Flossenburg um, it was a camp that Dietrich Bonhoeffer was sent to he began resisting the Nazis in 1933 when he went on the radio and said, um, he, he pretty specifically called out um, Adolf Hitler and the German people years before others really realized that. Um, Bonhoeffer had the choice to stay in the United States where he later, later fled to, um, where he studied and um, became fed by the words and the thoughts of the African-American spirituals. He had um, planned to go to visit Gandhi in India, and then he in, didn't end up go there, going there. He went to take charge of that seminary, the seminary that he would use to train pastors um, and that he would serve for years um, until he died. Bonhoeffer, um, in 1943 was arrested and was sent to a military prison. And I just love this, um, the way it talks about, um, about him. It says, during this time, the prison guards were friendly to this strong pastor and secretly took him to the cells of despairing prisoners to minister to them. They preserved his papers, his essays, and his poems, and they even established a courier service to his family and friends outside. Can you imagine? Um, somebody, um, he was literally about as socially distanced as you could get, and yet the guards saw his faith and said, 
we need to we need to slip these letters out to some other people so that they can um, so that they can see his words. He was transferred from one prison to another. Um, the prisons in Berlin, Buchenwald, Schoenberg, and finally Flossenburg, and all contacts with the outside world were severed. His last weeks were spent with men and women of many nationalities, Russians, Englishmen, Frenchmen, Italians, and Germans. And it says, one of these, an English officer wrote about Bonhoeffer. He seemed to spread an atmosphere of happiness and joy over the least institute, incident and profound gratitude for the mere fact that he was alive. This is in a concentration camp, y'all. He was one of the very few persons I have ever met for whom God was real and God was always near. On Sunday, April 8th, 1945, Pastor Bonhoeffer conducted a little service of worship and he spoke to us in a way that went to the heart of all of us. He found just the right words to express the spirit of our imprisonment, the thoughts and the resolutions it had brought us. He had hardly ended his last prayer when the door opened and two civilians entered. They said, prisoner Bonhoeffer, come with us. That had only one meaning for all prisoners, the gallows. We said goodbye to him. And this gives me chills, y'all. He took me aside and said, this is the end. But for me, it is the beginning of life. That scripture that Bonhoeffer spoke of on his last day, that last sermon that he gave in the camp was, with Christ's stripes are we healed. He was talking about the cross and the empty tomb and how it has redeemed us and how it's made this whole new garment, this whole new world for us to put on. And so friends, I am wondering as we go, um, how does God have for us to live with courage and hope? How does God want us, when we are going one way, maybe to stop, to slow down, and to turn around <laughs> from one spot to another so that we can walk in the way that leads to life? As we go, I'd love for us to finish out with some music. Um, some music from Annie and Isabel. They um, recorded this and for us. And this is a song that I think is the prayer of a lot of our hearts. Um, in the highways, in the hedges, in the highways, in the hedges, I'll be somewhere working for my Lord. So receive this as a benediction as we go. Oops. <laughs> Thank you all for your patience. Not me. At Sundays at six.
Amen. Thank you all so much for worshiping with us tonight. Thank you for being here. And I wonder as we go, if you can think about how you're being called to turn around and how can you slow down? How can you think about how to be God's coworker in stitching this new garment? One not of exhaustion, but of rest. One not of inequality, but one of equity. One not of um, just consumption, but also making something beautiful. Friends, I'm so glad that you are here with us. Uh, if you would like to um, help us with some music, uh, pre-record a prayer or, um, or anything like that, then please do reach out to us or email me. We are looking at putting together a, um, a Zoom meeting for after next Sunday's worship at, six, at 7.30 so that we can share dinner together. But I am so glad to be in it with you. I'm so glad that we are all in this together. So take good care of yourselves. Wash your hands. Stay home if you can. Stay healthy. And we'll see you next Sunday at 6. Good night.